The justice system doesn't deal with causes, it deals with symptoms. It's a legal tool that's never going to work with social problems. Nobody who's looked at what prevents crime has ever, any, any I don't know, maybe there's some academics in this room that have read some things that I haven't used to read all this stuff all the time, because I wanted to understand as a judge why my court system that I love so much wasn't working. The first thing I find out is the court system is based on the notion that punishment changes behavior. Well, the only folks that believe that are lawyers. There's nobody else looking at human behavior believes that. Or that violence stops violence. Everybody else out there who's got the pedigrees and degrees and everything to look at this issue basically says, gee, holy smokes, if you want to make somebody violent, then respond violently to violent behavior. You know, we're bequeathing the next generation a whole bunch of people that we're now putting in jail for 10 or 15 or 20 years. The United States has something like 600,000 people coming out of their jails every year who have been in jail for five or more years. We can't sweep the problems under the table. We can't think that the justice system's got a magic bullet. What has always worked is connection, connection to, to people in the community. I mean, I'll, I'll tell one of my favorite stories that came out of Kwantlen Dunn. One of the uh, offenders, one of their responsibilities was to uh, develop a talking circle for men in the community. Did that, went well beyond the time in which they were required to do it by the circle, the sentencing uh, circle. And about two or three years after they'd been doing this, they invited me out to one of their talking circle retreat weekends. And I said, sure. And I went out on the Saturday, they'd gone out on the Friday, and, and uh, I knew from the map where it was, but I didn't quite realize how far it was. It was about seven miles from the nearest uh, road they'd gone in by Skidoo's, and I skied in with my then dog. And got there, and we sat around, had a wonderful supper that night, and we were sitting around the circle, and they said to me, so Barry, look around the circle and see what you see, see if you can tell me what we all have in common here. Well, I wasn't going to say that they were all Aboriginal people, and I was the white guy. I looked around the circle trying to figure out what it was, and then it suddenly hit me. I put every one of these guys in jail at one time or other. <laughs> and I'm seven miles away from the nearest. <laughs> An interesting moment. But then I, so the, the conversation went, well, what's happening now? What was happening then when all of them said this? Well, we're connected to each other. We really haven't changed much. We'd like to go stealing and do all that kind of stuff. But we've kind of made this pact. And as to keep this pact and to keep the connection to each other, we're trying it. Now, I'd like to say that this is a Disneyland ending, you know, and they, and they walked off in the sunset together. But when the funding for this organization stopped and there wasn't anybody to continue the follow-up, a lot of those people relapsed. Community justice isn't about magic single events in which people change their lives. It's about getting them in that magical single moment to change their attitude about and their hope about what their life is. But if they've been into substance abuse and suffering all the things that they have, that Joe's talked to you about, it isn't going to be one day, one process that's going to change them. You need to stay with them and the follow-up is really important. And that's why social control, social community needs to be there. And they need to, community members who are going to volunteer need to have the support and the funding to keep them in the play. You're doing a great job of advocating on our behalf, by the way. I'm advocating on <laughs> my own behalf. I, frankly, if the justice system is going to stay around and people are going to want to come into it, we got to feel like we're making a difference. I don't know a single justice person I said before wanted to, just wanted to sign up so they could put bad guys in jail. They want to sign up because they want to make a difference in their community, just like you do. And, if, and uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> there are people in this room who are professionals who got through community work to become a human being and a professional at the same time. And don't think for a moment that the system, the criminal justice system, is just bad on the people going through it. It's also really hard on the people who are working in it. So I'm advocating for all of us. 
looking at the whole issue of transformative justice, one of the biggest issues that, that I struggle with is we aren't taking the time and we have difficulty to take the time. If, it, if I were to have a, you know, my dream come true, it would be every Aboriginal person go through a Gladue process or a circle process. And that sounds like a huge amount of resources and a huge amount of time. And I know in speaking to a court worker in the Yukon, she said, yeah, she took the time and spent um, quite a bit of energy putting together a Gladue report. It's, it's very time consuming. And when she got to court, she was happy she did because it actually had an impact. And in looking back at all of her cases, when you have one court worker dealing with several different communities in many, many cases, it's not very often where you can say, that worked out really, really well. I'm glad I took that time. So when you think about that, we're not taking the time as often as we can to deal with individual case by case. Certainly recognizing that not everybody is suitable for transformative types of processes. However, at least we're going to get the time and the people who are involved because most of my experience has been that most of the time the community members don't even know that their fellow community member is in the court process or is even in jail. They just kind of show back up again. Nobody knows where they went. <laughs> so um, when we're talking about transformative justice, we can, um, we can jump in our car and and take the fast route, or we can uh, take the scenic trail and go up over the mountains and uh, take many more days to get there. But one's going to be more rewarding and more fulfilling, and hopefully you'll have much better results down the road. In fact, I think an approach like that, you could potentially save yourself a tremendous amount of time and money as the years unfold with each case. Many of the early judges in many of the communities, that's the first concern that they bring up is, oh my gosh, all this restorative justice takes so much time. Well, maybe, but not the way if you count it properly. If you count the time from the time somebody commits an offense till the time they're sentenced, and all the professional time that has to be spent in that period, you've got a lot of money and a lot of time that adds up in little chunks of five minutes here, 10 minutes there, 20 minutes there, doing this document, doing that document. Then the big thing is, if you have a 75% failure rate, then you're gonna be spending that same amount of time within the next two years doing that case all over again. So what are you counting? I do work in institutions and corporations now. I mean, studies indicate that probably most managers spend about 25% of their time each year dealing with personal conflicts. I don't want to work with Larry. I don't want to work with Joe. I don't want to work with so-and-so. Those kinds of conflicts. You multiply that times their salary and you figure out how expensive it is for most institutions to deal with those things. In looking at um, where we're at now, a lot of our problems have come from the institutionalization, the residential schools. When they say that the past is the present, I spent about four years in child welfare and the past is the present. It was the most horrifying experience um, I have ever had in working with a system, simply because of the tremendous impacts on the community. And, and when we talk about a holistic approach, one of the things that we would see is the dad in jail, the mom in uh, the uh, women's uh, center, and the children all in care. So in one incident, you've had your whole family removed from your community. And this is just a really, this was a common thing that I experienced over and over again. So when we talk about a holistic approach, we can't say this is child welfare or youth justice or adult justice. This is about a whole community, whole families. And these situations have been created by the institutional policies. And I don't think it's the institutional policies that are going to heal or change our communities. So when we're looking at how to assist people in learning about their culture while they're in jail, that's very, very back end. And um, I don't think it's going to be our corrections policies or any of those policies or any type of institutionalization, no matter how great and culturally relevant it is, that's going to undo the institutionalization. We can't expect the institutions who created the problems to undo the problems. When we talk about resolving the problems at the community level, that's where the values are, that's where the relationships are, that's where the learning's going to happen. So the excitement is, is uh, 
the discussions that are happening about um, pushing the system back into the community or pushing, pushing it so that the system isn't as engaged as soon. So that's kind of one of the, one of the, the things to think about as we move forward in this very important time in justice. Hey, I know, hey, I know, hey, I know.